Welcome to Critical Issues Commentary, the podcast ministry of Gospel of Grace Fellowship, a non-denominational Christian church in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. This is Jessica Kramis, your host for today, and I'm speaking with Bob DeWay, Gospel of Grace's teacher and theologian and author of Critical Issues Commentary. In this series, we are discussing the priesthood of every believer. If you'd like to see the article on this, it is issue number 133. You can find it at the website cicministry.org. All right, to get us started, I'm going to read 1 Peter 2, 5. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And you say in your article, we are built into this priesthood by Christ, not ordained into it by church authorities. Yes, and that was a revolutionary idea, not that it was a new one, it's from scripture. Yes. But for centuries, church authorities arrogated to themselves roles that would put themselves between the people and Christ and totally redefine or change or confuse the idea of what's taught in the Bible, which we all have direct access to God if we are born of the spirit, if we know Christ. Okay. So this uh, holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ means that we know Christ because we believe the gospel by his grace and we're born of the spirit. And that's who are part of this priesthood. That's right. And so we are all priests to God, according to this passage, and really the clear teaching of of scripture. And yet in Luther's day, Rome was claiming that for themselves. Right. And then the other issue that not only Rome gets wrong, but we've talked about elsewhere, is the assumption that anybody born into a Christian home is automatically a priest to God and all these things apply to them. Right. And so if you get that wrong, pretty soon you have this massive Christendom that supposedly has all these beliefs and privileges and what have you, when in fact they believe none of it. And people are born dead. Yes. And so if we don't get that right, then this won't make any sense. And people end up, some I've known, have gone back to Rome thinking, well, I was born Roman Catholic. I must just have to go go through that system and do what they say and try to get things right. But we are not priests to God because we were born of Adam. In Adam, all die. We're priests to God because we're born again in Christ. In Christ, all are made alive. Right. So we are made priests when we are born again. We are not made priests by some ceremony within the church. Right. There, everyone who is born of God is someone who has been born of the word. The Holy Spirit comes to us through the word. Luther was right about that. Those who believe are those who are born of God. And so when you look at this passage, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That's not some high holy organization. That's a relationship with Christ. Right. And and that's reiterated in 1 Peter 2, 9, where it says you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We've been born again. We've been made priests of God, and he has done so so that we can go forth and proclaim his excellencies. Yes, the virtues of God. That's true for those who believe the gospel and those who are unconverted, who haven't turned to Christ, who don't know him, whatever religion you're in, whether it's a nature religion or or a Christianized religion, like Roman Catholicism, or a cult like Mormonism, or other sorts of religion, none of those things apply to people who are still in darkness. Right. And so 
I've preached through Colossians. We've written about that. Preached through Ephesians now. And we've, I'm working on Acts, and we keep referring to Acts 26, 18. Conversion means going from darkness to light, from domain of Satan to God. So what goes wrong, and this is why it's so important to understand the priesthood of every believer, is the assumption that what country you're born in, what family you're born in, what version of Christendom or paganism you're born in, all of that is not what matters. If you don't know Christ, whether you're Jew or Greek or whatever, you're still in darkness. Right. Listeners, if you're in darkness, you're not going to get out of that by joining some higher order version of some priesthood or apostles and prophets or whatever. You get out of darkness by believing the gospel and trusting in Christ and believing the truth about who Christ is according to scripture. Right. Now, just to make sure we haven't created any confusion for any listeners, when we're talking about being priests of God, we are not using that as synonymous with an elder or minister of the word. Right. We'll get to that. The, those who are elders and preachers by God's grace that meet the qualifications. Yes. People within the church, but everyone has direct access to the throne of grace. The Roman Catholic hierarchy and the hierarchy of other groups that claim to be Christian put some roadblocks between people, even in their prayers, their assurance of the forgiveness of sins, the idea that God hears us when we pray, that we need somebody to somehow move the demons around so that we can get through to God. There are so much confusion. So, so many people don't even understand the basics, and it's in scripture. I have no authority to, to tell anyone something that doesn't follow from scripture because it won't help them. Right. And so if we don't believe in the authority of scripture and the priesthood of every believer, we don't really have a starting point. Okay. Now let's it's just review for, for our listeners you had identified seven things that were applicable to priests that every believer can do. Number one, the ministry of the word. Number two, to baptize. Number three, to administer communion. Number four, to bind and to loose. Number five, to offer sacrifice. Number six, to pray for others. And number seven, to judge doctrine. Now we are going to address each one of those things as we go through this, but according to Luther, and we believe according to scripture, all believers are called to do or have the ability to do each of those things. Right. That doesn't mean everybody's qualified to be an elder or a teacher. God has different callings for different people. But if someone who says, well, I'm the elder, you have to believe me because of my position, and then proceeds to teach an unbiblical doctrine, then any believer that understands and knows the scripture can say, wait a second, can you show from scripture that that's true? Now, right. day, there were some people who left Rome, and they didn't know what to do because they thought they needed this whole system to even have forgiveness of sins or even have prayer or even have the Lord's Supper that anything would happen. And so this material, which comes from the writings of Luther, helps us. And also, and I mentioned this before, some will say, well, but Luther was anti-Semitic. Semitic. He wrote bad things. He believed, at least his followers, that you're saved when you're baptized as an infant, all that. But here's the thing. We're not claiming that we have to listen to Luther. We're claiming that he was right about the priesthood of every believer mm -hmm. and the authority of Scripture. So I'm very willing to debate any of those doctrines from Scripture. And if Luther says, I believe in the authority of Scripture and the priesthood of every believer, but I also believe that the Jews 
are rejected forever, the church, whatever else comes from that, then judge that based on scripture. Right. So that should help us understand that. Okay, There's so a, let's talk about the ministry of the word. When we're talking about the ministry of the word, what does that mean? The ministry of the word is the fact that anyone who understands the gospel is a, from scripture is someone that can teach whoever it may be. He mentioned things like your own family or people that want to learn. We can open the scripture together and minister the word of God. And the reason this is so essential is that were we not born of the word, we wouldn't even be part of the church. Right. And so uh, I was going to quote this and then we'll, we'll start on that section. Okay. Here's a longer quote from Luther. According to him, for a priest, especially in the New Testament, was not made, but was born. He was created, not ordained. He was born not indeed of flesh, but through a birth of the spirit by water and the spirit in the washing of regeneration, and which would be John 3, 6 to the end of that section, Titus 3, 5. Indeed, Luther said, all Christians are priests and all priests are Christians. Wow, okay. So that means there are people called priests in various religions, including Roman Catholicism, that aren't even Christians. <laughs> right. Now, how can you say that? Well, if you don't confess Christ, you don't believe the resurrection of, of, of the dead, you don't believe that sins are washed away once for all by the blood of Jesus, and you don't, you're not born of God, but you were put into a position by a religious organization claiming to be Christian, you may say that you're a priest, but if you're not born of God, you're not even a Christian. Right. And many people have found that out and come to Christ and eventually find other believers to gather with and to study the word of God. So the first thing that a priest needs to do is to preach the word of God and study it and learn it. And that is something we all do. We aren't all preachers we, I mean, in that we stand at the pulpit and we preach a sermon every Sunday, but we all do encourage and exhort one another from God's word. And we minister to our family and we teach our kids and we all in some way are teaching God's word to someone. If we believe it, we want to teach it. Right. It's our joy, and we love to talk about the Word of God and all we're learning. And, and it's such, you know, that's why I love Sunday school at our church so much, because we can sit and discuss together and we can judge doctrine. And it's such a blessing to just come together as, as the family of God and encourage and exhort one another from God's Word. All right. So you say in your article, since the church is born of the word, the ministry of the word is the most essential matter. We need the pure word of God to be proclaimed by the church and to the church. Absolutely. And I've mentioned this elsewhere. After the institutional church that had been self-perpetuated for many centuries started to be questioned because of all the abuses and wickedness that was happening. Then the question is, well, how do you know? What's a church? What's the biblical definition of the church? And the church is a group of people born of God who gather together in his name and share the basic necessities of Christian fellowship, which is summarized in Acts 242. Okay. Which is fellowship, breaking bread, prayer, teaching the word of God. And so if the word is purely taught, let me give you some examples. There are cases where the word is taught accurately and correctly by people that otherwise are rather heretical. Okay. Yeah, many times over 50 years of being a Christian, people have come sometimes to a Sunday school class or to church 
and said, well, I came from such and such a group, which whether they're apostles and prophets or whatever their claims would be, but I hadn't heard some of these things. So we're not saying, well, we're the true church, just join us. I'm saying, study the Bible, be Bereans, search the scriptures. And if the word of God is purely taught, those who are born of God will grow. Because right. as we're born of the word, we'll grow when we hear it. And we'll, and we'll hunger to learn more. And we'll, we'll just keep doing that. And if we get off, according to scripture, then we can help each other get it straightened out. So it's not who's ordained. I'm not saying there cannot be ordination because certain um, civil authorities require it. Okay. Do weddings or funerals or whatever. I mean, that's changed. But the fact is, if you ordain an unbeliever so they can do a wedding, it doesn't make them a priest to God. <laughs> that's right. And That's there's always the justice of the peace. They don't require being born again. Yeah. But let me quote something here that I wrote about and then quote Luther, claiming that the Roman Catholic ordinations were wicked and pious. Luther urged that public ministry of the word be of foremost importance in the church. And then I have a block quote in this article about it that came directly from Luther. Okay. Ordination indeed was first instituted on the authority of scripture and according to the example and decrees of the apostle in order to provide the people with ministers of the word. So that's correct. If someone's ordained, they should be preaching the word and capable of doing that. Yes. The elder in a small group needs to be able to do that. Let's go on. From quoting Luther, the public ministry of the word, Luther said, I hold, by which the mysteries of God are made known, ought to be established by holy ordination as the highest and greatest function of the church on which the whole power of the church depends. Since the church is nothing without the word and everything in it exists by virtue of the word alone. So the word of God is central to everything. Right. And when you use the term mysteries, it doesn't mean that some shaman deciphers things that are rather mystical in the spirit world. In the New Testament, a mystery is that which would not be known had God not chosen to reveal it. Okay. And so when you come across some of these terms, like secret or mystery or hidden, if it's something that pertains to the gospel, it's now revealed. Yes. The last yes. in First Corinthians we were in 1 Corinthians 2, 8, and it said none of the rulers of this world knew this, of this age knew this um, secret or mystery, whatever you want to call it, because had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, 1 Corinthians 2, 8. Okay. So okay. It turns out that what they didn't know was that God had chosen to send his own son the creator into the world born of a virgin and that he predicted his own rejection crucifixion and then subsequent resurrection on the third day but their hatred for god whether it's the romans the jews or the spiritual powers of darkness all attacking christ they can't change their nature they hate god and they want to dishonor christ so that's what happened. Okay. So I preached on that recently, 1 Corinthians 2 8. However, he accepted all of the shame, all of the dishonor, everything that was to be avoided in their world in order to pay the penalty once for all for sins, in order to bring sons and daughters to glory and bestow honor on dishonorable people. Okay. That's the gospel. Yeah. So this is so important. What has been done wrong throughout church history is that we want honor in this world, which we can't get by being born of God and preaching the gospel. <laughs> right. And how do you know that we want honor? Well, the, the motives of the heart are only known to God, 
but we judge by the fruit. And so when we demand status that we can't know whether we can have or not, don't go on judging before the time, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, God is the one who decides which Christian is served favorably in some way. That's for the future. Right now, if you're part of the family of God, if you know Christ and God has called you, that's the most honor you could ask for in this world. Amen. Wow. So if you don't have robes, you don't have incense and bells and spired cathedrals and pomp and layers of hierarchies and all these things. You don't need it. That's yeah. religious honor, but it's not from God. It's from this world. So the, the Roman Catholic Church had all of those things. And this is exactly what Luther was rejecting. And you have a quote in your article here. Uh, this is Luther. Henceforth, neither seek nor receive ordinations from the son of perdition, even if he offers them. Yeah, see, in this world of, uh, what would we say, this world of religion, ecumenism, false ideas, the desire to have a one world system, to race categories, then the things that the Bible says really don't make sense to people. Right. So the New Testament elders are to be apt to teach, 1 Timothy 3, 2. Luther claimed that the Roman Catholic ordinations were ungodly and should be rejected. And yeah, you, you quote that. He called such ordinations the son of perdition. Since all Christians are true priests, we don't need added status. We don't need to be honored. We should honor one another. The greatest honor is to be part of the family of God. Right. And that's all that matters. If you don't know Christ and you're living in darkness, what sort of ordination will do you any good? It won't. It, it really won't. It really takes a work of grace as we watch history unfold. It takes a work of grace to really believe that it's worth living for Christ and trusting him to make things right in eternity. That there is a future judgment. That people who have power, status, and everything else this world has to offer are actually fools because in eternity, they'll have nothing. They'll be judged. Okay person having nothing. Luke points that out in Luke uh, 12, the parable of the rich fool. Remember the guy was uh, saying to him, in Luke, when somebody talks to themselves, it's not good. Yeah. Self, I know what I'll do. I'll build bigger barns and so on. So he's talking to himself. And then the answer is, thou fool. Today, yeah. your souls are part of, of, of the, now who will have these things? The more I studied Luke, Acts, and Ephesians, and First Corinthians I'm teaching through, if you take away eternal life, you take away God's promises, not only for heaven, but ultimately the millennium and a, a new heavens and new earth in the end, God's system of, of judgment in that regard, if you don't believe those promises and you want things right now, you'll always be deceived. Yeah. And that's why you have so much of the social gospel. People are demanding things that will harm them and everyone else. It, it really isn't the gospel. It isn't the church. The church isn't here to right every wrong, to create some sort of a social process that's going to make everything good here and now. We're here to preach Christ and to tell people they can escape from this. And I see political debates, which I'm thankful that people can debate political ideas, although it's really a mess right now. In the end, our hope is in Christ and the gospel 
and the only God is the judge of the whole earth. Remember, I debated a merchant guy. And they say, well, we don't, we don't like anything that has to do with judgment of the cosmos or the earth. Everything's evolving. Remember, we wrote a, well, we got a book about that on emergence. Yes. Well, what promise of God says there'll never be future judgment? None. We know there's judgment. What we don't know is what is if somehow it's going to happen right now or later or future. We don't know when the church age ends. And if we don't, don't know we're right with God, then that's a big lie. Don't worry. No one will ever be judged. Get your best life now. Be happy. That's not the promise of God. Right. And so Luther was giving people from Scripture, from the promise of Scripture, status that they would never have had had they gone to Roman Catholicism and tried to find it. They would never get this. Keep giving. Keep going. Keep doing what we tell you. Keep going to this illegitimate priesthood that God never ordained. You can't know that you have eternal life unless you keep working, working, working. But the Bible says that God has made everyone who knows him part of this royal priesthood. All right. Do you want to give us a little wrap up for today? Okay. I, I made a statement here about on the third column of this article we're working on, issue 133. All Christians as priests of God are given the privilege and responsibility of teaching. Luther correctly pointed out that those taught might only be one's own family. But a father and mother teaching Christ to their family honor God and are a great blessing. Amen. And so we need to honor God, believe his promises, teach the word of God. There's no guarantee that everybody that we teach wants to hear it. There's no guarantee that everybody we preach the gospel to will be happy. Most won't. But we honor God by believing his promises and teaching. And we're not someone who can just pass it off to somebody else and say, well, I grew up in a church. Go talk to the priest. Wow. All right. We are out of time for this edition of Critical Issues Commentary Radio. You can access this episode and many others, as well as years worth of articles at the website CICMinistry.org. While you're there, click on contact and send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. We want to encourage you all to stand firm in one spirit with one mind and strive together for the faith of the gospel. For Critical Issues Commentary, this is Jessica Kramis. And Bob DeWayne. We'll see you next week.